Well, being a grandparent has been one of the joys of my life. I have 13 grandkids, and yes, it was quite an accomplishment that I did. Thank you very much. And uh, one of the things, if you are new to grandparenting or someday you will be a grandparent, there's something you need to know, uh, and that is a grandparent's role. A grandparent's role is to spoil the grandchild rotten and then hand them back to the parent for the appropriate discipline that they may need because of whatever you did. Or to feed these grandchildren sweets and goodies and then the parents can take them to the dentist. Whatever needs to be done, the primary role of a grandparent is to be the hero in their life. And one of the things I love about grandparenting is that my grandkids think I walk on water. My children should think that too, but no, they didn't get it all that time I raised them. Well, uh, the, uh, the story I want to tell you this morning uh, happened many years ago with my oldest two grandkids. Uh, my son lives in St. Louis, and uh, luckily, because I had a job and one of my clients was in St. Louis, I got to fly there frequently. So about three to four times a year, I would go there on business. I would stay at my son's house. I would spend time spoiling my granddaughter's rotten. And I'll never forget one time I was visiting there and my daughter-in-law said, could you do me a favor? Tomorrow I have to take the girls to the doctor for an appointment. Would you mind coming with me? And I said, yeah, I'm sure I'll be happy to help. So we took the two girls, one was four, one was about two, and went to the doctors and they took the youngest one in first and she was back there for a while and my granddaughter was having fun. It was kind of a kid's play area in the lobby and she's on this little fire station thing and had just having a great time. And uh, all of a sudden, partway through her playtime, we heard this scream, this very familiar scream and crying coming from the other side of the wall in the doctor's office. And she stopped for a minute listening to what she knew was her sister crying, and then got back to playing. And so I sat there for a while and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I think they're getting their shots today. I have pulled a major faux pas in grandparenting world by assisting her to take these girls. And about a few minutes later, the nurse comes, opens the door and says, all right, we're ready for you now. And she looks at me and says, no, no, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. And I picked up my screaming, crying granddaughter and did something that no grandparent should ever have to do and take her into the room to get her shots. How that should have played out is I should have heard that there were shots and say, I'm sorry, I can't help you, but I'm happy to take them to ice cream after you're done. That's what should have happened. But I did not get the Papa of the Year award that day. I had to work back into their good graces over time. I, I got derailed in my plans to be the super grandpa. That is a description of a lot of our lives when we are facing something, something we expect, something we want, an outcome we want to have happen, and then we get derailed. And we've been talking about this over the last few weeks, and Pastor Chris did a great job last week talking about how sometimes we get derailed, and there's a reason for everything, and sometimes the reason is we're stupid, right? Play stupid games, get stupid prizes. And I thought he did a great job. If you haven't heard that, go back online and listen to that. But even though when he was talking about it last week that sometimes things are not God's will, we just do things that are stupid, I'm going to talk this week about sometimes things are God's will. And sometimes we get derailed because of that. And there's uh, something about God's will that's a little bit difficult to explain and it's difficult to understand, actually kind of impossible, but I'm going to do my best this morning to do that for you. Now, first of all, I'm going to do a little theology. Don't worry, we'll get into a, a little more easy to understand things, but I'm going to start with what God's will is. There's really three types of wills when we're talking about God's will. First thing is the decretive will of God. I don't know if you heard that word, but decree, he decrees things. So if God decrees something to happen, it's going to happen. There's no way around it. For instance, if God says, let there be light, there will be light. 
If God wants to create, it's going to happen. When God decrees certain things, they will certainly happen. But then God has a will that they call the preceptive will. Sometimes people call it God's command will where he commands things to happen. Uh, for example, uh, you've heard of the Ten Commandments, I assume, correct? They didn't call them the Ten Best Practices or the Ten Suggestions. They're the Ten Commandments. And God said, I command you to do this. I command you to do that. Don't lie. Honor me. All these things. Did we obey all Ten Commandments? How is that possible when that's his will? You see, there's, there's starting to be some... Uh, misunderstanding about how God works because how could it be that when he declares something to happen, it happens, but other times he declares things to happen, but it doesn't. The reason is because he's working with moral agents who have the ability to say yes or no, which leads us to God's third description of his will, which is his permissive will, which doesn't mean he's giving you permission to do something bad. It just means he allows certain things to happen because of your moral agencies and however he wants it to fit into his plan. Is that clear as mud for you yet? <laughs> if you don't feel confident in what God's will is, join the club because it is really hard to understand. But I'm here to tell you this morning, sometimes things happen, we get derailed because of God's plan. The first thing in your notes, go ahead and pull out your notes if you haven't, or uh, pop up the notes on your app. I want to talk about how we get railed. Number one, we get derailed when I assume I'm able to fully comprehend God's will. If I believe I can fully comprehend God's will, I'm in trouble. Because God's will is not a math problem that you can figure out. We hear a lot uh, in the past, we've heard of people writing books about when God's going to come back, his second coming, when God's going to establish his reign in the world. And those books are uh, in used bookstores because it didn't happen yet, right? People try and figure out God's will all the time, but it's not simple. It's very complex. And the minute we begin to think we can figure out everything that has to do with God's will and the why behind God's will, we're going to run into problems. Let's see what uh, Isaiah says about how God thinks and how God plans. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Whatever you think is right, whatever you think is good, whatever you think is the right direction to go, whatever it is you're thinking, just know this, the way God is thinking is on a completely different level, a completely different realm than you are. He says, my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. The smartest person on earth can't possibly comprehend the plan of God. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, we have to start in a place of humility realizing that there's a difference between us and him. Uh, I, I've ever heard a parent trying to negotiate with a toddler? Have you ever, ever heard that happen? Or a parent trying to explain something to a toddler and how that sometimes goes? I have a little video clip that I want to, to use to illustrate that this morning. Go ahead and put that up. I'm pregnant. All right. Have you ever said that to God? This makes no sense. We're the toddler in this scenario, not the parent. Just to put it in perspective, we all carry around with us a three-pound brain. 
Some of you might have a little heavier than that. Some maybe a little lighter. But in general, we have a three, uh, three pound brain and we're born with 100 billion neurons in our brain. It's mind boggling to think. That's as many stars as there are in the Milky Way galaxy. We are pretty smart. We can figure out a lot when it comes to things like technology. I mean, in fact, it blows me away <clears throat> the technology they have today that has to do with gaming. Like, they don't even do just games anymore. Now it's a virtual 3D reality world that people are doing with gaming. <clears throat> when, when I grew up, our technology was dirt clods and sticks. There was only about three games you could play with it, but that was it. We had uh, kick the can was a big deal game in my day. It required a can and a foot. That's it. There's been a lot of advancement in technology since I was a child because of how smart we are. There's been a lot of advancement when it comes to the world of physics. They, they've discovered over many <clears throat> eons of time how physics works, like the speed of light. Anybody know the speed of light? I know because I studied this week, 168 or 186,000 miles per second. That's very fast, but you know what? They're not 100% sure because they can't measure it accurately. <clears throat> you can't send light from here to there and measure it accurately, accurately because there's a problem with space and time. So you can't synchronize two different, uh, re you know, a receiver and a sender. So what they do is they send it to a mirror and send it back. And there, it's well known that it's assumed that after it bounces off that mirror, it comes back at the same speed, but no one knows that. Maybe it goes faster and it comes back slower. Do you know that when it comes to atoms, there's electrons that go around atoms, but there's different levels. There's, there's a first ring and the second ring and a third ring. And so atoms, depending on the kind of atom you have, have more and more electrons or less. But sometimes an electron will go from one ring to another ring. But you know what? That, it doesn't move inwards. It disappears off of one ring and appears at a lower ring at the exact same time. How does that happen? I don't know. We look into things and try and figure things out when it comes to, to our own bodies. In the last 50 years, we've learned incredible things that we're not just a bunch of gushy, remember caveman days? I poke with stick, red stuff comes out. You know, that was the tech, technology. Now, now we know about all kinds of things with our organs and in our cells. We have these intricate nano machines that are working in incredible orchestration with each other. I mean, the things we know about ourselves now are mind-boggling that our minds have been able to understand over the years. What about the spiritual world? How much do we know about the spiritual world? Well, not much because what we see is the physical world, what we touch. The only thing we might know about the spiritual world is what somebody else reveals to us or maybe what we guess right about it. So if we, with this three pound, 100 billion neuron brain can figure out so many things, understand this, that God, he's the one that created the universe. He knows every atom, think about that, every atom everywhere, he's holding it all together. God understands us because he created us and designed us. It says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. He did it on purpose. And he knows things we will never know about ourselves. And certainly in the spiritual realm, he's there and here at the same time for all eternity. But at, he sees it in a different way than see, we see it. So of course his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. There's no way it couldn't be that way. But sometimes we feel just fine judging God because of some of the things he does in our lives when in a sense we're cl way closer to ignorant than we are wise. So that's where we're going to start, by the humbling place of admitting that we don't know everything we need to know. So I'm going to show you how these three wills kind of work together sometimes. Bad things and good things happening all at once. Acts 2.22, Peter, after Jesus had died and rose again, was, was talking to the people basically that had put him to death. And this is what he says. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, 
wonders and signs through him, as you well know. So God said, this is my man. There's no one that can do this. There's no one that can calm the seas with a word or raise somebody from the dead who's been in the grave for four days or, or heal the sick and give sight to the blind. Jesus did things that clearly are supernatural. There's no other explanation for it. But he goes on, but God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. So somehow in God's plan, he took into account the free agency of people that would use that agency for evil. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in its grip. You see, we struggle sometimes when we try to completely understand everything there is about the will of God because quite honestly, it's not quite understandable. We can't fully grasp. We just have, have to take at face value the fact that God did this, that what God did through Jesus was good, and at some point we have to trust him because he knows more than we do. Bad things happen sometimes that are God's will, but it doesn't mean he's, uh, he's responsible for it, he's accountable for it, because people act in their free agency to do what they're going to do just like these people did. So if you want to know what God's will is, I'm gonna give you one, there's a lot of ways we can understand God's will, but I'm just gonna give you one little way we can go home today and know what God's will is. And it's found in uh, 1 Thessalonians. I'm sorry, Ephesians, Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will reg regarding Christ, which is to fill, fulfill his own good plans. Let me say that again. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. So in other words, Paul is saying, yes, God's plan is mysterious. The reason you know it now is because I have revealed it to you but his will is for his good plan. His plan is dependable. We can put our trust in his plan. When things don't make sense in our life and our life is going off the rails, we can stop and we say, I can trust God's good plan. Just like Christ went through difficulty, but it was because of God's good plan. So first, we need to make sure we're not trying to figure everything out when it comes to God's will. Yes, he does direct us sometimes, but in the end, we can't fully understand it. Number two, I get derailed when I act on my limited knowledge to work against God's will. And we do that sometimes, right? Maybe well-meaning even we work against God's will. I have kind of a, it's not really a pet peeve, it's just something that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I hear it, all right? Uh, and that is when people tell me God told me to do this, or it's God's will that you should do that. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing to say, and some of you have said that, have said that and, and I'm not condemning you. I've just seen it abused so many times that it makes me a little nervous sometimes. When somebody says, God told me to marry this person. You mean that train wreck? Yes, them. They get married to this person, and then they get divorced six months later. And I am thinking, did you also know that God said don't get divorced? Like, where does that play out? We often do things because we want to do them and we get our will confused with his will. And it's easy to do. And it happens when we respond quickly. We don't think before we say. We don't think before we act. We don't look deep inside, as Pastor Chris said last week, and understand the why for the thing we want to do. And that's important. We evaluate what's going on inside of our heart. I love uh, Peter because Peter's kind of like the guy who says what everybody wants to say but doesn't, and then he gets in trouble and everybody else gets to feel smart. So Peter is talking to Jesus. Jesus has spent three years with these men. He's loved them. He's shown them miracles. He's taught them. They've seen power coming through him. They've seen him transfigured, glowing. They've seen amazing things in his ministry uh, with, with Jesus. And, and 
People had all kinds of expectations about Jesus, including the disciples. And so as Jesus is nearing his death, it's about the week before his death, he's telling the disciples again what's going to happen. We read it in, uh, in Luke here, excuse me, I'm Matthew 16. It says, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Oh, if he'd only asked a question before he made this statement. Because Peter gets the most severe rebuke that you will see in scripture from Jesus. Jesus says this to him, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things from merely a human point of view, not from God's. You see, Peter had an expectation of God's will and wanted to see God's will happen. And just like many Jews in that day, what they wanted to have happen is to get out from the Roman occupation. They wanted to have the freedom to worship God in the temple without worrying about Roman soldiers. They wanted just freedom in general and for God's kingdom to be established. And for some reason, what Jesus was saying was not lining up with what they wanted. And so Jesus had to confront Peter and say, your will is not my will. And we can run into that same problem if we get ahead of God and we begin to go after things before we take the time to ask God a few questions, to seek God in his word, and to prayerfully and humbly consider what God's will for our life might be. Here's what... Uh, Here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians about God's will. He says, be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful, and I've heard people say they're thankful for cancer or they're thankful for death. Or it's not saying be thankful for the things, it's saying be thankful in the things. He says a difference Bad things happen. They're not good. People hurt us. Uh, the, the just nature sometimes destroys or kills. Or there's all kinds of bad things that happen in the world. But what he's saying is, listen, we have a God that's beyond that. We have a God that's not just constrained by what we can see in this world. We have a God that has an eternal perspective. And so therefore, we can be thankful in anything that's going on because we're being thankful for a God who loves us and is there for us, who has a good plan. And no matter what things look like in our life right now, he is going to enact his good plan because he is a good God. So we can be thankful that's God's will. Amen? It's interesting because I think it's natural to be thankful for things that are hard, or easy, I'm sorry. The, the winning the lottery is a, a thing. I don't know, we talk about winning a lottery a lot in church, so apparently we won't want you to buy lottery tickets, but... <laughs> If you won the lottery, if you get a promotion, if you get the girl or the guy or whatever it is you want in your life for the house, it's easy to be thankful. It's harder to be thankful when things seem to be going wrong, but be, just because things are going wrong doesn't mean it's not a part of God's will and he's not doing something very powerful. Which brings us to our third point. I get derailed when God wants me derailed for his greater direction. There are times where God will move you right off your track because he wants to do something good in your life. You know, I think sometimes we get the feeling that our careers should keep going the way they are, or our business should keep gro growing, or uh, our relationship should keep getting better, or our health, or whatever it is, or life. We, we just assume it'll keep going on just the way it is. And 
Something happens and we get derailed. And all of a sudden we're going, why did you let this happen? How could you let this happen, God? When God may be do, doing something very powerful in your life. Some of the most difficult things in life come, or excuse me, some of the most difficult things in life uh, create some of the greatest opportunities and the greatest chances for growth and learning. Uh, I, I've had so many inconveniences in life. I, I used to get frustrated. Now I just kind of look for what God's doing in them. Uh, I remember one time I was flying home and I like getting home. I don't like being on the road if I don't need to be on the road and my flight got canceled. Oh, it, it started with me locking keys in the rental car and they give you all the rental keys. And so couldn't get the, uh, the trunk open to get the keys out to the next day. And anyway, long story short, I was delayed a whole day and I ended up going to the airport. I sit next to this doctor. We start talking, start talking about his marriage. He's struggling. We spend two hours talking about his marriage and I was able to minister to him. You know, I, a bad thing happens and a good thing happens. It just seemed to be the way God works. A bad thing happens and a good thing happens. They just don't all go on the good side. They just seem to come together bad and good alike. It says this in Hebrews 12, five and six about being derailed, it says, so don't feel sorry for yourselves, which we tend to do, or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children? My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed, excuse me, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. It's the child he embraces that he also corrects. And I think we think about discipline in kind of a negative way. Like when your child misbehaves, you discipline them. And we think, oh, am I, being, am I misbehaving, Lord? It's more than that. Sometimes there's things in our lives that we just need. Like isn't patience a good quality to have? Well, if God's going to teach you patience, he's going to put you at the longest line in the grocery store. He's going to put you on the freeway when you want to go 80, even though that's illegal. And he's going to put you behind a guy in the fast lane going 65. He, he's he's going to bring one thing after another to slow you down until you begin to understand patience. If he wants you to be a better lover of people, he's going to put really difficult people in your life. That's the only way to learn how to love people deeper is to make it a challenge for you. So we have a God that only wants what's good for you. He only wants to transform you into a greater version of yourself, something that he sees in you that you don't even see in yourself. And so as God is sometimes derailing us, it's for the purpose of creating something in us that sometimes we don't even know he's doing. We don't even know sometimes that he's trying to put patience into us. But after a while, we realize, oh my gosh, I'm a little more patient than I used to be. We have a God that is so for us that he derails us because he has a better plan for us. But not only that, sometimes he derails us because he has a better plan for somebody else. And he's going to use us in that. It says this, in Luke 22, Jesus is, uh, at this point in his ministry, it's his last night, he's had the supper uh, with the disciples, he, he's in the garden, he tells them, please go with me, you pray, I'm gonna go pray, and uh, he goes off, and he prays three times to the Lord, and there's something you need to know uh, about Jesus, if you don't already, is uh, he is, God in human flesh. Uh, Jesus declared himself to be that. He accepted worship. And we don't understand the Trinity again. Remember three pound brain, infinite God. We don't understand the Trinity. We just know it's true. It's declared in scripture. And so Jesus comes into the world having had an eternal love relationship and eternal fellowship and connection with the Father that has never been broken. Never. None of us could possibly imagine the, the depth and the quality of the love that God has in himself. And 
Jesus had this unbroken, eternal connection, and at this point, he's going to be bearing the sin of the world. He's going to be taking on himself everything that we have ever done and everybody has ever done in history, and he's going to be paying the penalty for all that for the sake of allowing us to be reconciled to God. He's go we know, understand uh, the judicial system. We know that if there's a judge that just someone's lets someone off the hook who's done a crime, we consider that person a bad judge. God is no different. When crimes are committed, when we do things that are selfish, there's some sort of a consequence that has to happen. Otherwise, God's not a righteous God. But at the same time, he is also a merciful God. He is a loving and a compassionate God. So how do you take a perfect, righteous God and a loving, merciful God? How does a God like that reconcile people like us who are so broken? He does it by putting everything on his son, Jesus, that we deserve and giving us every blessing that Jesus deserves. That's what happened on the cross. But Jesus had to go through the process of experiencing that aloneness. On the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt alone for the first time in all eternity. Let's read what it says here. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will be to done, your will to be done, not mine. See, Jesus even understood as he's beginning to face the reality of what he's about to go through. It, he's asking God. It, it's starting to not make sense. And maybe there's already been a process of a disconnection from God. We don't know that. But he prayed three times the same thing. And in the end, we don't hear that he gets any answer. He just gets up and quietly goes off and does what he know, knows the Father's will is for him. He did that because he was wanting to save us, to help us. That's the reason. Sometimes God derails us because he wants to help somebody else, just like he did with his own son. There are difficulties, there is pain you're going through in your life, and it may be horrible. And there's probably stories in here that would just make us weep but it might be that he's allowing you to go through that because he's going to help somebody else because of what you've gone through. He's going to give somebody else encouragement because of your experience. He's going to give somebody else knowledge and a path to go forward because of what he's given you in your path as you've worked through some difficult times in your own life. Never assume that because you're going through something horrible that God hates you, he's mad at you. It could be the very opposite. He loves you, he values you, and he wants you to use you for something far, far greater than you even imagined for yourself. But it takes pain sometimes. And in the end, all we can do is say, God, I don't like this. I wish this wasn't the case. But I trust you and I trust your good plan because I know you're a good God and you've demonstrated that in sending your son to die for me and reaching out to me and loving me and forgiving me. And so I'm just going to trust you right now. Just lead me through this difficult time in my life. He won't let you down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we don't just have to go through this life figuring it out ourselves. We don't have to just know every circumstances and the why behind the things that happen in our lives because we have a God that does know why. We have a God that does know everything he needs to know in order to extend grace and extend comfort and extend help and to transform us and change us into the people you want us to be. And he can even use us in the lives of others, even using the pain and the difficulty that we've gone through in our own life. And Lord, everything we go through on this earth is ultimately temporary. And Lord, we know you know that too. You have an eternal perspective. And the 
light and momentary trials that we go through here on this earth are not comparable to the glory that you have for us in store in eternity. Help us to trust you in this world. When we go through dark times, help us to look for the opportunities to grow that you want for our lives and help us to be used even at the point of sacrifice if that's what it takes in the lives of others so that you might be glorified and your good plan might go forward. And I just pray for anyone who came in here this morning that just feels like they've been through it. And maybe as I'm talking about all the pain and the difficulty, they identify with it all. I just pray you administer to them, help them to know that you love them and you have not abandon them or forsaken them. You're actually right in the midst of it with them. And you can identify with their pain more than anyone else through what you've done in Jesus Christ on the cross. And we just thank you, God, for your grace in our life. And we just ask that you would help us to, to begin to trust you more as we go through this life and be used by you more. In Jesus' name, amen.